Hey everyone, welcome to Locked On Lakers for Thursday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. Does Austin Reeves need to stop flopping? And is LeBron James really tied for the best player in the NBA? At least one group thinks so. That's next. You are Locked On Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks, to everybody, for making Lockdown Lakers first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcast. It's always going to be free. It's never going to be behind a paywall. And Lockdown Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to hang out with a bunch of Lakers fans, nearly 20,000 strong on that page, um, getting excited for what the Lakers have done this offseason, getting excited for what's coming up in the fall, and getting excited for the NBA's new flopping rules. Uh, maybe well maybe not that uh but that's something we're going to get into today which laker might need to be um a little more conscious of the new rule going into the season that they will begin calling technicals for people who are uh seen as flopping and why that person is austin reeves uh <laughs> and so we will, we'll get into that uh, or the so perception no- if nothing else that it is austin reeves it just it, We'll get into it, but I, when I saw this rule, I did. it made me think of Reeves, not even so much because of what I think of him, but mm-hmm. what I think others may think of him. So back again, we sh- to the left, <laughs> back and to the left. He is he is a man of, of neck snapping. There's no question. Um, so uh, if we get to it, um, some uh, new odds out on uh, wins in the Pacific Division, which I thought pre- pretty interesting. Title odds are out. Uh, Vegas starting to put up some NBA futures, which uh, as free agency is not done, but getting there, um, are, are starting to become a little more meaningful. We mentioned yesterday a player on the roster uh, patterning himself after Contavious Caldwell-Pope, uh, and it is, I thought, a really great sign. We'll try to get to all that stuff, but we want to start here. Every year, this is one of these things that I always laugh at and try to like pass off as not a big deal. And then I start looking into it and I start breaking down what other people. And I'm like, you know what? I kind of wonder if this is like a good shorthand for 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 what teams look like, Andy. I'm talking about the 2K ratings, uh, and they have leaked um, the NBA 2K ratings for this year for uh, for the the 24 version are out. Um, and we have been digging into them. I know, Andy, you found some very interesting things. The, the, the big publicized number is LeBron at a 97 for the Lakers, but we don't have to start there. Well, just for people to know, 97 puts LeBron in a five-way tie for best overall rating in the league with Nikola Jokic, Giannis, Luka Doncic, and Joel Embiid. LeBron is ahead of Kevin Durant. He's ahead of Steph. He's ahead of Dame. Shea Gilgis Alexander, uh, Steph, and uh, Anthony Davis, among many, many others. Um, going Do we through, know if it's 2K is a, is a clutch client? <laughs> <laughs> they, they do have two guys, I believe. Uh, you know, Anthony Davis is like a tear down from LeBron. They do have two of the higher rated guys, at least on the Lakers. I mean, I haven't even looked at the entire list as far as all the clutch clients. Going really quickly for all of the Lakers, there are 2K24 ratings. LeBron, as we said, 97. Anthony Davis, 94. D'Angelo Russell, 83. Austin Reeves, 81. Jared Vanderbilt, 80. Rui Hachimura, 76. Gabe Vincent, 75. Torian Prince, 75. Jackson Hayes, 75. Cam Reddish, 75. Max Christie, 71. Yeah, I saw that and I was like, you know, my vote for guy most likely to outplay his um, 2K rating is Max Christie. Like, there's no question. And I, well, you know, I, I don't play the game enough to know like what's considered really, really good or really, really bad. But like, it does seem when you scroll through it, like you know, the roll guys are somewhere in the the the, the mid 70s to low 80s and like if you start breaking into the 80s you've got some skills that at least the video game designers want 71 is like we're not sure why you're here and i don't think but if they do this at the end of the year i don't think max christie's gonna be a 71 we'll see i i certainly hope not i mean the, the way we're seeing if nothing else signals in the summer league means he could end up outplaying that 71 and and like you i don't play 2k24 regularly at all i tend to think of these numbers as if they were school grades, which may or may not be the correct way to do it, but it's just 
how my brain is wired. Um, I will say this, if nothing else, the Lakers are somewhere between hopeful and you're damn right it better be this way. They're expecting Rui Hachimura to outplay a 76, particularly when Jerry. Yeah, I don't care what a 76 means. <laughs> like, really, the, like well, he needs to be better than that. Well, especially when Jared Vanderbilt's an 80. And yeah. I don't even mean that so much uh, a- as it pertains to Vando as it is. They need Rui Hachimura to not be four points behind Vando, no matter how you're determining this. Right. You know, Gabe Vincent. It's just, but it, it is it is interesting. Like, you know, there, and we'll talk about this you know, maybe a little bit later in the show when we get into, um, uh, you know, some of these these betting numbers and stuff like that. I mean, the Lakers get a little bit of a boost. And, you know, I, I the, the numbers, you know, it's, it is what it is. But, like, you know, LeBron James, is he getting a bit of a LeBron boost there? Sure, fine. But, like, it it is it's kind of a microcosm for me of like the push pull between what in your mind LeBron is still sometimes capable of being like, is LeBron tied for, you know, in a five way tie for the best player in the NBA anymore? Absolutely freaking not, not over 82 games, not over that. He is not, is LeBron potentially tied in a five way tie for the best player in, in the NBA in any given night um, through a potential, you know, playoff series for a week where you need, Oh yes, he still is. If he can stay healthy, if he can do all these, there's so many caveats to kind of weigh against, but when he's right or when you really need him, he is still capable of being spectacularly good. It's also extremely important for the Lakers this season, regardless of how much you think, the difference between a 94 and a 97 actually is, it's really important that Anthony Davis feels like a consistent 97. <laughs> like, I mean, he's he's still ranked very high in 2K24. Like, there's only about 10 players. Right, and I don't, I don't know what he was in the 23 game, and, I'm, and neither one of us are looking this stuff up. But, well, I mean, I speak for yourself. I've actually done a fair amount of research, Brian. But it is really important to the Lakers that Anthony Davis feels definitively better than say Shea Gilgis Alexander or Damian Lillard or even Steph KD. Like they need AD to feel like a guy that got snubbed at 94. Um, The Lakers, by the way, for what it's worth as a team, 2K with a lot of respect for them. Uh, They rank the teams overall in different tiers the Lakers among the Tier 1 squads this season, joining Boston, Golden State, the Clippers, the Grizzlies, the Heat, the Bucks, the Pelicans, the 76ers, and the Suns. Then once you start breaking into T2, you've got your Hawks, you've got your Bulls, you've got your Cavaliers, and some of these teams start making it feel like if you're not at the upper end of Tier 1, it isn't all that impressive. <laughs> um, all right, so I, it turns out looking it up wasn't that complicated. Anthony Davis was a 90 last year, and LeBron was a 96, so people thought LeBron got better. Um, and uh ad you know the you know he's another guy that that push pull we'll talk about that next remember you're only as great brian as your last game and lebron's last game was a game for the ages that's true um so let's uh let's let's look at a few more of these numbers uh and 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 kind of the push pull of what these things you know the angst that this stuff uh builds up when we're talking about anthony davis we'll get to that and more next Locked on Lakers is brought to you by BetterHelp, and it's easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself and for yourself. It's hard to balance being there for your significant other, for your kids, extended family, work, but again, remembering those moments for yourself. And when you spend a lot of your time feeling like you're giving, it's normal to feel stretched thin, burned out, and life, unfortunately, does not come with a user manual and it's not working, it's normal to feel stuck. And I can personally speak to how much therapy helped me during a really difficult time in my life for me and my family. And just sitting down, talking with someone was huge. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient. It's accessible anywhere. 100% online. There's no waiting rooms. There's no traffic. Plus, it's affordable. So just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist if things aren't clicking you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. So if you want to live a more empowered life, 
Therapy can help you get there. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on. So when you start, Andy, to kind of like break this stuff down, it it becomes this like it's a, it's like the most frivolous reminder of how kind of the the the, the range, the incredible ceiling and in the you know the high ceiling and the low floor for this Lakers team. Because like you know what, Anthony Davis absolutely is a ninety four, a ninety five, a ninety six, whatever. He is totally capable. And had you know had stretches where he was that guy. For so much of the season, he's also capable, Andy, of being a zero because he's not in the lineup. LeBron, um, you know, even in, in in year twenty, is capable of of carrying a team and being that sort of force, even if it looks different than he did when when he, even if he can't do it for eighty two games in a row, he's also capable now of missing twenty five or thirty games and you know, every you know, finger crossed in LA once you get towards playoff time that these guys stay healthy. Like, and I understand, you know, every team has this, but it, it just like it, 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 it is a reminder of the state of the Lakers because relative, even I think to some other teams, the fragility of the Lakers is, is pretty, and their stars is pretty stark. Well, I think in particular with LeBron, what makes it feel that way is you can't help but wonder when the bottom is really going to fall out because people are not supposed to be doing this at LeBron's age. You're not no. even supposed to be playing basketball professionally at LeBron's age, much less still being a guy that is a critical focal point of a team. And we've acknowledged many times, like the the decline for LeBron may be relative compared to the rest of the league and like the rest of history, but it, it's tangible in terms of you can see it. Yeah. And you, you can feel it beyond just the fear of absence. You can feel it in the way that he can't always be a two way player. You can feel it in the ways that he has to take plays off. And then you combine that with Anthony Davis as the guy that is supposed to be the one as the, the, the alpha male, on the court, like in practice anyway, and the concerns about him, as you acknowledge, all teams deal with this. Talk, you know, just ask the guys, uh, you know, down the street with the Clippers. But LeBron in particular adds his own unique wrinkle to it because he's a really unique player now and in history. Yeah, just the acknowledgement that, that he can't do it night to night, like the, what I was talking about in the first segment. Like, you – it is there – on a night, if you need it. it, is there maybe on two nights? It is there in a playoff series or whatever. But it, you can't can't sustain it throughout a year. You had a couple other numbers that you that you wanted to look up uh, that you looked up that that are fascinating about the way that at least the gamers view the Lakers this season. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was funny. First of all, looking at some of the individual numbers and recognizing, at least I think, because again, Brian and I are not regular players of this, but I I think in a lot of ways your your green, yellow, or red rating can be just as important, if not more, than your actual. Well, score. by the way, that they got Wenyan Gabriel and Tristan Thompson still there. Like, do they know something well, we don't? Until they end up on another team, they are. Oh, I gotcha. Connected to their last team, and and the last team was the Lakers. But you know the 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 color can mean more. I think at least the, it can be more indicative of something than the actual number itself. But when I saw, you know, they they start breaking down players overall, their three point rating, and then their dunk rating. I saw they had D'Lo and Gabe Vincent, a red forty five for dunks. Which, when I first looked at, it, I was like, "Damn, that is harsh. Like that that feels barely higher than what my dunk score would be." Just considering these are NBA players and I'm under six feet. But then I did some digging, Brian. You're under five ten. Right. I did some digging for both these guys and searched D'Angelo Russell dunk on YouTube, Gabe Vincent dunk on YouTube for D low, the top five videos, two of them feature the same dunk. And then for Gabe Vincent, I'm not sure any of them are actually him dunking. I didn't go through all of them. There were a few though, with him getting dunked on. And there's some there where it seemed like uh, there was a play where Gabe Vincent happened to be on the floor when, when a dunk happened. 
Eight seasons in the league, Brian, 495 games. How many dunks do you think D'Angelo Russell has for his career? Oh, in, in eight seasons? Eight seasons, 495 games. <laughs> D'Angelo Russell, who, by the way, is 6'5". <laughs> and scores a lot. Yes, he does. It's not like, you know, uh, I, I will say nine. Okay. He has more than that. <laughs> 20. <laughs> he has 20 not, dunks in eight seasons. not many more. Not, not many more, plus three in the playoffs. Four seasons in 20. The 20 for a 6'5 guy in eight seasons. Mm -hmm. Nine is actually not a bad guess. Four seasons in the league. How many dunks do you think Gabe Vincent has? <laughs> well, I have to admit, I, I cheated. I, I, so I, I As soon as I started, I wasn't sure. I, I went and looked up. He had one last season. Mm -hmm. Um. How many more? <laughs> he had one last season. Uh, I'm going to give him one per year. So I'll say, and plus, you know, he was a little spicy maybe in his rookie year. Uh, happy to be around. I'm going to give him five. Ooh, you really, really are being generous too. He has <laughs> two in his career. And so the, yet... the dunk he had in Miami this season was his second career dunk. Yep. Uh, he's also wow. yet to throw down in the postseason. I also noticed that the 2K folks, um, when they give like a brief summary of those each... guys are, oh, by the way, my two favorite players now. <laughs> yeah. yeah they <laughs> across they, the league. <laughs> they give uh, brief summaries of the player alongside like their overall score the dunk rating and the three-point rating and they describe that most of these score or the, these descriptions are pretty accurate but they describe gabe vincent as an inside the arc score no <laughs> no he is not nba 2k he is he well, is well he is inside the arc because he's not a very good outside shooter either but he's he's not an inside the 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 restricted he was, area he like, was dunking. third he was 13th percentile according to cleaning the glass at the rim among guards for percentage like and 11th for attempts make or miss 91st percentile for three-point attempts 92nd for corner attempts he is clearly an outside scorer and i'm happy to have gabe vincent i like the signing i think he's going to be a really good uh, addition to this team he is not a an inside the arc scorer at least by trade certainly not last season uh, also, by the those... way, just for comparison purposes, how many dunks did Jared Vanderbilt have last year? I'm going to say 31. 98. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Jared which... Vanderbilt had four, five times as many dunks last year as D'Lo has in his career. <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of Jared Vanderbilt, I noticed his three-point number and color... He's a yellow 72, and this is a guy who is a career 29% <laughs> three-point shooter. Hit seems, a like high mark was, for, seems like that was written by Jared Vanderbilt. <laughs> yeah, he hit a high water mark for his career at 33%. Are you allowed to Lakers. submit your own rating? <laughs> do, you, like, do they Teams send it out and you're like, tell us, is it like your self-evaluation at work? <laughs> like, what, How'd you do this year? Yeah, teams were daring Jared Vanderbilt with like a red freaking carpet to, to take like seriously open corner threes like for cam reddish is an 81 if cam reddish was a genuine 81 the lakers wouldn't have him he'd uh, still be in portland or, or not, Atlanta or not New York. On, damn sure wouldn't have him on a veterans remember minimum. when i said earlier how i i sometimes will use these things as shorthand i feel like uh it's very very short now the more you like, dig into it like yeah, look Torian well, Prince at an 82. Basically, Cam Reddish is rated the same as a three-point shooter as Prince, Reeves, and Russell. If but, that happens this year, by God, speak that into existence, 2K, yes. because, oh my God, what a revelation Cam Reddish would be. Yeah, like Jackson Hayes is a red 60, which even of itself feels a little high, but the gap between... Jared Vanderbilt and Jackson Hayes. Like, I'd rather have Vando take that shot. And I, look, Vando has been working his ass off. We've seen clips of it this offseason. Maybe he shows up and he's a reliable corner three guy. Mm -hmm. And if if he's just 35, 36%, that's 
awesome. That'd be great. But <laughs> I don't I don't feel very yellow when yeah, Jared takes you know, he, shot. he deserves an 85 or an 86 for his NBA 2K got that dog in him rating. But oh yeah. You know, the three point shooting. Well, um all right, let's uh let's take a look at, at Austin Reeves. We'll get to maybe try to get to some of this title stuff. If we don't, it'll hold until Friday. Uh, but the new flopping rules are out. Um, and both of us agree that of all the Lakers. This probably has the most impact on Austin Reeves. We'll talk about it next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by Bird Dogs, the makers of shorts and pants that feature the future of comfort, which is built-in underwear. It's stitched inside pants or shorts, almost like a layer of boxer brief that is at one with the clothing, and they call it Comfort Kingdom, and you can rule this land in your Bird Dogs. You can look better, feel better, while wearing those bird dogs, the stretchy fabrics makes my legs, your legs, everyone's legs look great, and they are comfier than Mine other shorts. Mine already looks good. Now they well, look fantastic. Oh yeah, I, I look like one of those like pinups from the, from the, like the forties. What like, dams those Kamensky brothers have? <laughs> Absolutely, like it's you don't have the restricting stiff cotton that's in most legwear. Bird dogs <laughs> fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks like khaki, but it stretches. It's versatile. You can. Wear the same pants or shorts on a golf course, a work meeting, on a date, even in the same day. So go to birddogs.com. Can, slash... can I interject real quickly with my favorite feature about bird dogs? I, trust me, the back pocket. So go to birddogs.com, locked on NBA. When you enter the promo code locked on NBA, they will throw in a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. Check it out. Again, it is all, the tumbler in and of itself is worth it. So get your tumbler and get yourself some bird dogs. So the rule, Andy, is uh, after I think a season of of commentary, and this is sort of just typical of the NBA. No, nobody spends more time complaining about what's happening on an NBA floor than people broadcasting NBA games. But um, flopping, Andy, seemed to get out of control. That was the the consensus across the league, and uh, the NBA is doing something about it. If the referees believe that you have flopped. You are uh, you can get teed up for that now. That is uh, that is a rule, um, and I think we, our heads both went to the same place when we thought about who this might impact the most on the Lakers, and uh, it was Austin Reeves. <laughs> it's funny. I don't consider Austin to be a rampant flopper. Like I honestly don't, but he is a grifter. Oh. He's absolutely a grifter. He is somebody that seeks those calls. I think he's very good at getting them. But as he's gained notoriety because he played so well last season and saw his profile go up, I've noticed a lot of complaining about Austin Reeves getting to the line and a lot of people lumping him in with the great floppers of the league. And this is my question, though. Are we talking about, like, do you think this is going to be called? Because I'm, I'm a little nervous about how this could impact the flow of play and, like, guys, you know, sort of referees kind of interjecting themselves. I think people generally underrate the 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 level of impact and you know this oh that guy outweighs this other guy by 30 pounds how could you be like you know okay the, the average 175 185 195 pound player in the league might be smaller than someone else but is really strong and they are often moving really fast and you do not have to be that off balance to go to the ground, to to fall down from contact and any of that stuff. Do you think, though, because I look at Reeves, I agree, grifter is a great word for it. But it's more on the offensive side, I think, when he's trying to draw fouls than it is on the defensive side when he's trying to take charges. I think he does, you know, he'll, he'll embellish both. But I feel like the real complaints, like you said, are what he does on the offensive side to get to the line with the head snaps and the flopping back after contact and whatever. Do you think they're going to call that sort of thing as aggressively as what they might call on the defensive side? Because both, I consider both to be flopping. Yeah. It's interesting with Austin. I'm not even so much concerned about him racking up fines for flopping as I am just the refs being more conscious in general about not falling for blank. Mm -hmm. on either side of the ball. So he's just getting fewer calls, period, which don't they may not reward him, you know, as far as like what what might be considered theatrics or whatever 
on either side of the ball. He's just he's not getting penalized in one way or another. It's just more play on. Right. And it is such a, you know, again, it, there's a difference between offense and defense. And look, Austin Reeves takes a ton, a ton of charges. Like so legit charges. Yeah. And this'll this will be part of that. And again, when a person some part of taking charges, part of the self-preservation of taking charges is anticipating the contact and starting to go to the ground just slightly before the person makes full impact, you know, in your chest so that you don't die. <laughs> it's like, you know, standing there and taking the full brunt of it, you know, because you're worried about like that hurts. And so, you know, there is a little bit of just, you got to time it right or you won't get the call. But, um, I, I, the, the 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 biggest problems Reeves had in those rare moments where they happened over the last you know third of the year into the playoffs or whatever is when his game kind of shifted to foul hunting, yeah, um, you know seeking whistles more than kind of seeking buckets and you know putting himself in a position to get both. Um, I, I don't. I, you hope this sort of thing, like you say, you talk about like referees becoming just more aware of embellishing contact on either side of the ball whether exactly. it's key or not that, yeah. you hope that doesn't impact the mentality he has when he goes into the lane if anything else you know hopefully it it improves the parts where he's not trying to just shades more towards picking up a call rather than than getting the bucket well i mean it's it's like anything as a player you have to make adjustments and my concern is just overall there's just going to be more awareness of you don't want to look like you're falling for blank. And whether you consider what Austin does on either side of the ball, both sides of the ball, whatever, flopping, there is theater to it. Like there's always theater to what ends up being called a flop. There's always a certain amount of theater to calls that you legitimately get. Like I remember when we were covering the, the Kobe Pow team, we saw these games and in person enough that we noticed that Kobe – Pow and Lamar Odom all had different sounds that they made when they were yeah, trying exactly. to get that whistle. Like Kobe was like, Hey, and Lamar Odom was like, Oh, and Pow was like, Ah, <laughs> like it was, and it was the same. And like thing. different parts of their body would yes. flop. Like Pow had yes. the arms, Pow would do arms. And look, for the, for the most part, I think all three of them were making this sound with, you know, against legitimate contact and against stuff that, if nothing else, deserved consideration as a foul call but all three of them were selling this that's like that's part of the game and i just started wondering about like how much of the salesmanship referees are going to have their antenna up against and then again nobody i think could be more potentially affected by this than austin reeves because yeah. it's become part of his game and it's but it's and the other part about this too is like you know the, the the other half of it is you, like a lot of times you have to sell contact because if you stand there and take it, a foul that should be called, whether defensively or offensively, won't be because, like I said, these guys are really strong. And so sometimes you have to indicate the contact is there. LeBron, Shaq, whatever, like uh, these really big, strong guys, if you don't show the contact, is there, the referee may not notice it. You know, it is sometimes that reaction. And I'm also not one of these people like, I don't want James Harden anywhere near my team. But it's not because of I disapprove of his style of play. Um I I find, You've always liked it more than I do. But I just I find the skill set of being able to draw fouls like that, of being able to change speed and put your body in, you know, adjust your body position, all that stuff. Same thing that you know, Trey Young is really good at it, Harden is really good at it, and Austin Reeves is becoming one of those guys as well that understands that nuance of the game. I think that is a, a really impressive skill to be able to do that. So it doesn't bother me. Like when Trey Young puts on the brakes, when he knows he's put a person on his back and he can get the call and still make that little baby floater, you know, that, that is a skill. It requires practice. And I don't, I, I don't have a problem with it. It bothers a lot of NBA fans. It does not bother me. Um, I just I, I I I some of this stuff is I think based on just a dislike of that kind of 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 exploitation of the rules, uh, but it doesn't bother me as much as bothers other people. Um, we'll get to this title odds stuff maybe for for Friday because um, 
some of these numbers, when you look at whether we're talking about championship odds, uh, wins over unders for wins are starting to come out. Those things, all of these things are are fascinating to look at, particularly after. Uh, the bulk of free agency and, and trades have been taken care of. So we'll get to all that stuff uh, later in the week. Uh, Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you can go to see the show, hang out with upwards almost 20,000 subscribers. We'll see everybody on Friday.